Over the last decade, we've seen the emergence of a new position in the fitness industry, a way to make money, the fitness influencer. This really didn't exist more than about 10 years ago, but now it's a potential avenue to build a business if you love fitness. Here's the problem. Most people do it totally wrong. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about the biggest mistakes people make when trying to build a business as a fitness influencer. You know what I wish we would have done? I, I, maybe Doug can do this while we're, t we're talking. I wanted to uh, find out the stat on, because I remember hearing it, uh, you know, reading it in an article, one or the other, on the uh, like top like five things that kids are asked in high school like what do you want to be oh well not youtuber mm. or, or influencers like up there now right? yeah now yeah i mean that i mean that didn't exist just say 15 years ago yeah. as an even option and it, it went from being not ever being an option to all of a sudden a top five uh thing that a that a kid you know, a profession that a kid wants to wants to be when they grow up i find that really interesting that something like that it skyrocketed that fast i wonder how yeah. serious though they'll be when they grow up. you know like uh like depending on culture, kids tend to want to do the thing that gets a lot of attention. So like if you asked a bunch of kids, especially boys in the 1960s, what they wanted to be astronaut would have been like the top yeah. because we had the space race and stuff. I don't think kids say astronaut at all anymore. Um, uh, you know, professional athlete, although I think that now kids are starting to realize that that's um, or have realized for a while that that's Super, super rare. Ninety-eight uh, percent of middle middle school and high school students would like to be a social. Ninety-eight yeah. oh, percent. I think God. the perception is that it's just like easy thing to do. Basically. Well, they follow I, all these influencers. Well, I there's actually no barriers. I mean, really. it, there's no barriers. It's relatively inexpensive, so you don't have to you have post something. And they live on it all the time, yeah. so it's like they're constantly just like paying attention to all these other people doing it. So, and I would imagine that. Everybody or every kid by now probably has, you know, like the, the Kevin Bacon thing, right? But within six people, they've probably got somebody who they know mm -hmm. who's young and making a lot of money doing it. Wow. Or at least has a lot of followers. You know what <laughs> I mean? Well, blew my okay, mind. That's, that's a, probably what So it that's is. a good point. Like I have, I, and I even There's have a, a big gap. I have between. a buddy who's in his late 40s who I talked to, and his, his, his wife and him are in the social media thing. They kind of got into it in the last like 10 years or whatever. And he'll send me people over who he really likes. And even someone who's older, been a serial entrepreneur, I would I would consider a smarter guy is, is, or a more savvy guy when it comes to business. Still, the, his perception on what is a really – like he's sending me like, oh, you got to check this. Like, yeah. He's so impressed with this, this guy's business. And I'm like – you know, it's funny because I know more about that person's business than obviously he does. And I'm like, you know, because this guy posts like Lamborghinis and like, you know, he's doing like he's flying on the private jet and he's, he's doing videos of his watches and he's got a big following. It's like this mm -hmm. dude's balling. He's got a killer. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't I don't think he's got as killer of a business as you think he does. So there is this misconception around two uh, problem and that probably uh, exacerbates this situation, right? That, oh my God, like every, if you got a hundred thousand followers, you got cool cars, yeah. you must have a sick business too. When that's not necessarily There's true. a lot of ways to kind of build that perception and, and uh, to rent things and to make yourself look a lot bigger than you are like in real life. And this is the kind of conundrum with the influencer space. It's just like, you don't really know for sure if they're authentic in what they're presenting. And this is just something that's, it's always like very grandiose what they want you to perceive. There's a whole business around that. There's yeah. an entire industry built around uh, products and services to make you appear as if you're more successful than you are because it provides some form of like uh, social evidence. So if you're following right. somebody and you, you're like, huh, I wonder if they're, you know, they're good to follow. They got good information. I kind of like them. And then you see that they have like a Lamborghini or they're in a private jet. Like, okay, they must be they really be good. It. But the thing with social media is obviously you can present whatever you want. And all, you're always trying to present an image, which makes it hard to judge whether or not somebody's got good information or whether or not they're actually uh, successful. Now, to, to be clear, it's very, very rare to make millions of dollars as a fitness influencer on social media. Extremely rare, very, very rare. But it's very possible if you do a good job and you're diligent and you're consistent and you provide good information and good value to make a living as an influencer. I mean, you can, I could take somebody, so long as they're not terrible and they're lazy, if they're good and consistent and they do a good job and they apply themselves, I would say, you know, you've got pretty good odds at making a good living.
mm-hmm. using, um, you know, being a fitness influencer. The whole millionaire thing, that's the, forget that. That's like trying to be a, a pro athlete. But could you support yourself as a fitness influencer through work, effort, providing value, learning, and growing? Um, yes, you totally could. It's totally possible. These are the people that make the biggest, biggest mistakes, though, or the people who have that potential make massive mistakes throughout this pursuit, and then they become disenfranchised or they stop altogether. And I think that's what we should focus on. All right, today's giveaway is MAPS Powerlift. This is a powerlifting workout program. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you do all those things and you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a sale right now. MAPS Prime, MAPS Prime Pro, and the Prime Bundle, all 50% off only this month. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Using your yeah. pro athlete, uh, you know, analogy, what do you think it is? Do you think that they are, you know, watching the the one percenters that have made millions of it and seeing like how they act and what they do and then trying to to mirror that yeah. and thinking like that's the reason why they've had that's all this the blueprint in the form right so what do you think is that is that like that causes that like you, that's got to be part of it right uh what you think that that person is doing and so you try to copy it but all you really see is their social media so you're not really sure you just see their presentation and unfortunately the top top popular people, I should say, with the most follower followers in fitness tend to be like models or they look mm-hmm. like models. And so you think that that's the value and that's what you try to present. In fact, that takes us to the first one, which is a huge mistake that people make in the fitness space is you see the people with all the following on Instagram or social media, and they tend to be these perfect bodies, good looking, super ripped, super fit, and so you're like, okay, this is how I'm going to build a business is by trying to be um, like this, which uh, your odds of success with that are not only small, they're extremely small, but then also if you do succeed this way, your uh, your, your shelf life is very, very short. You're not going to have a long-term uh, business. Though. Well, I think that's the part that is most important is that because there is a part of that the, the formula that has been proven in our space to work, right? Like- the before and after pictures, the, you know, look where I was before. Now look at me, I'm shredded, like, or I'm, you're this gorgeous model. And so you get all this attention. And so there is, there is a part of that, that actually might be viable enough to, to grow an audience. Right. But to your point, it's really, really, uh, stressful to have built your success off that we've had the opportunity and I won't, name drop on here of, of people that have been in their, our space for a decade or so that have built it around social media that have got millions of followers. And a lot of them battle with like depression or feel like they're, they're not being their authentic self because they have created this image mm-hmm. that was built around their body and their physique. And even if they love fitness and working out, they're like, man, it's like, if I'm not putting that out there all the time, then I'm not getting the traction. If I'm not getting the traction, I'm not getting the conversions. I'm not getting the conversions. I don't have a viable business. Yeah. And so they, they get in this hamster wheel of having to kind of use their body and, and themselves like to promote that engagement all the time. And it's like, even though they made some good money on the way up, it's torture. In fact, I meant to bring this up on a qual the other day that I didn't bring it up to you. There's actually the, a counter movement to all this. I met, there's a girl, I, I'll look her up, see if I can find her name, but she's she. they did a big old article on her. She's a, a big influencer, had like a million plus followers with that, and she's been doing this for a while, and she's now making a business on a, how to get out of being an influencer. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, because like, and, and this is what she talks about, you know, building this all up, you know, this all this, and, and then all these affiliates that you're tied to, and then being like, I don't want to do this anymore. And then feeling trapped because you've made such good money. So yeah, she's, she's now making a business out of that's hilarious. People get out of the business. <laughs> Smart. Well, there's a there's a few um, reasons why this is really a terrible way to build um, a, a media business or an influencer business if you're in fitness, in terms of in the context of you know selling your body as evidence. One, and I'll start with the most obvious one, is to be beautiful enough or attractive enough or have a body that looks good enough to gain that type of attention puts you at the 0.1% of everybody. So right away, if you're watching or listening to this, you're probably not that. Okay. I'll bet that almost everybody watching this right now 
is probably not that. So that's number one. That's just realistic. Now, people might have distorted, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, yeah but <laughs> the truth is, not look, me. the truth is you, you're, you're not – Good, you're not that good looking to make that kind of an impression. Not that cute, of bro. It's just fat. Okay, <laughs> you're not that that's cute, just bro. that's so that's number one. But now let's go down a little bit. So let's say that you are that person, that you do have that 0.1 percent of appearance or body or whatever to gain that type of uh, type of attention. Well, now you've gained that attention. But if that's your first of all, if that's your what people value, how the hell do you convert that into a business? Because it's free. Mm -hmm. You're looking at me. For free on Instagram. So you see lots of pages like this on Instagram where people follow people because they like to look at them, but that doesn't mean they want to buy something from you. In fact, they're getting the product that they value already for free. Right. And we've seen this before with uh, their stories of these influencers who have lots of followers because you know, they're booty shots or whatever. Yeah. Then they try and sell a t-shirt and they can't sell a single one. So, so that's the second tier there is now how do you even convert that? And then here's the third one that uh, I think will appeal to a lot of real fitness enthusiasts or people who want to do this for a living. This is not the right way to sell fitness. If you're a trainer, if you're not just trying to build a business, but you actually have a passion for fitness, selling the appearance and the looks is the worst way to convey the right message for fitness. It's actually what's a big problem with the fitness industry and you're not helping anybody. It's not going to help anybody to do so. It's one of the reasons why we don't even use before and afters here at Mind Pump, even though our, our marketing team is constantly telling us to do so. It doesn't sell fitness the right way because the way you look is but one of the values that fitness provides. And if you focus on that, you are never going to help people develop this long-term relationship uh, with, with health and fitness. But and I'm then, inspiring people with how awesome I look. No, you're not. And here's the <laughs> last part. Here's the last part. And I'll say this. This is what Adam's talking about. You can get trapped in this. Uh, this is why people like me. This is my value. I'm making money off of it. I'm getting older. This is getting boring. I feel like I have more value than this, but this is all people want. And I know people listening right now who've never had a lot of money are probably like, I don't care. I just yeah, want lots of money. I think it's exactly how that I goes know. down. It's, so it's going in one ear and out the other. I'm going to tell you right now, it's hell. We know lots of people like this where this becomes yep. a personal hell to where people like them for, the, for what they're actually not. And they're making money. They don't know how to get out of it. And it sucks. It sucks. I don't like to keep posting this. The what am I doing? You slip, they'll turn on you too. And they'll turn on you. So yeah. it's a, just a terrible way to build a business. Don't you think it's a bit of a microcosm of um, celebrities and pro athletes? Totally. And what they go through? Like yeah. you, everybody wants to be this celebrity, you know, pro athlete or actor, actress. Yeah. And they think it's all, you know, glam and lots of money and awesome. But many of those, those actors, actresses and athletes after their career is over, go into crazy depression, become alcoholics, Dude, totally. drug addicts. And a lot of that is because they've, become, they've identified as this character that they've built up their entire life and it's not really their authentic self and they're tortured inside. Yet they have all this money and all this fame, yeah. but they're completely depressed. I think we're seeing that play out yep. in a, a, at a smaller scale or smaller scale in, in terms of probably revenue-wise of fame in, in social media. Sure, yeah. No, I think that's a great parallel because even you'll see a lot of these like actors, actresses, is like later on in their careers, like they're so known for their look, right? Like that's their entire value. And so they have to try and recreate that or at least preserve as much as possible with crazy surgeries and things. And, and yep. those don't always go so well. And it's just like, it, they just look completely tortured. Yeah. And you have a, you have a, a short shelf life. Like if you're, if people value you for looking perfect, how long can you look perfect for? And then what? And then you got nothing, right? Yeah. Versus your knowledge, or the value that you provide people through your coaching or your help, which uh, can last until you decide to stop, and it's much more uh, meaningful. But again, at the very top, your odds of building any kind of business based off of your looks is almost 0%, period, end of story. And I'm saying that because, there's again, there's people who are like, I don't care, I just want to make money. You're not going to make money doing that, so don't make that big mistake. All right, the second one, Adam talks about this all the time whenever he's talking to people about building business on social media, which is like people focus a lot – too much, I would say, on the follower count mm -hmm. versus actual engagement. I love it when you go into this, Adam. You yeah, so well, well. The, I mean, it's no different than if we were talking about like a, uh, you know, brick and mortar or a business that you would start 20 years ago is getting so hung up on just trying to get so much traffic your way. But if you don't have a, a good product, you don't add value, you're not engaging with the customer, the likelihood that all these people are going to purchase or buy anything from you is very low. And I, mean, I don't know how many times we've had somebody on this show or we've met 
who has hardly any followers, but has this multi, multi million dollar business and an extremely successful and vice versa. Somebody comes on and they have millions of followers and they have a, a terrible business. So this idea of just having tons of eyes on you is uh, means that you have a great business is completely false. It's what if, if, if I had somebody, right? Like, and I, and I, by the way, like I went through this like experiment myself when we first turned on Instagram and Facebook and all these platforms, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't know how to build a business off this. And I was trying to figure that out. And I remember using my physique to gain attention and get followers. And it's like, oh, the follower count was going up. But then what I realized was those people were following me for those reasons. And if I was trying to sell them a nutrition plan or a personal training or a product, had nothing to do with my half naked body or my abs. And so the leap from getting these people that are a bunch of looky loos to convert is terrible. And so I'd rather have five new people listening to me because I posted something about rehabbing a uh, knee surgery, right? Because I've trained a lot of clients that have had ACL, MCL issues. It's a common thing that's happened. They want to get back in the gym. What are good stretches? What are good exercises? I'd rather do a post about that, get hardly any likes, but get two or three people to go, oh, wow, this really helped me. I just went through yeah. ACL, MCL surgery. Thank you. That person or those two people that engaged in that post are far more valuable than 500 looky lose because I showed my abs on a picture before because one of those is is attracting my client, the other one is just getting attention. I'm gonna gi I'm gonna give, be even more extreme. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna really illustrate this. You if for from a business standpoint, from building a business, it's far more valuable to have a thousand really hardcore disciple followers. People that really are like, man, this person is the man or the girl. This is the person I'm following. I love what they say. Uh, I trust them. It's more valuable to have a thousand of those than it is to have a hundred thousand normal social media followers. Okay. If you have a thousand people that really follow you, you have no joke, a deep six figure business, or maybe even a million dollar a year business. If you have 100,000 people following you on social media, just normal following you, you're lucky if you make 10 grand a year off that. Lucky if you can make 10 grand a year. So that's the difference. 1,000 people who really find value in what you have to say, it is not hard at all. It's very easy to sell them a $300 or $500 or $1,000 service or product. You have 100,000 people following you on social media just because they like to look at you. Try selling each of them a dollar product. Good luck. You're probably, not gonna, you're probably gonna sell 20 people and get nothing else. That's the illusion that people have with social media. They see followers and they think, wow, all those people, no, that means nothing. Now I'm going to take a step back. Adam, you mentioned brick and mortar. We have become so distorted with followers that we don't even realize that these are potential customers. If I had a brick and mortar business and I had a thousand people walking through my door, oh my God, I'd be ecstatic. Yeah. But for some reason on social media, a thousand is like, oh, that's nothing. I need hundreds of thousands. <laughs> yeah. No, that's not true at all. Yeah. Engagement is everything. Mm. The follower count is almost nothing. Well, and two, uh, big businesses are privy to this now. Like they're looking for influencers and people who actually have those kind of comments in their uh, posts where there's back and forth and there's dialogue and there's they're really interested in what you have to present versus just the robots kind of like uh, you know marketing whatever they're marketing within your your post and and I think again this this goes back to being popular or just or having that kind of like fervorous type of engagement like like big businesses are paying attention to that and they want to invest in you know the smaller influencer that actually has that kind of of power and um, you know, in, engagement in uh, conversation no, with those fans. No, it's 100% right. Like I get the opportunity to talk to a lot of these these companies, right? Because I handle that side of the business for us with partnerships. And there was this kind of like learning curve for them. Uh, most all of them at one point when they had, a lot of them took on funding and so they had capital and they could go, okay, we're going to go spend $100,000 on advertising. So and what do they do? They go to the top of Instagram or top of Twitter. They look for just the most popular people that are related potentially to their product and they go pay them a bunch of money and they had terrible they had terrible success with that and it was and then what they found was way more successful was finding these what they call micro influencers 
that had maybe five or ten thousand followers, lots but, of engagement. but lots of engagement. They're they're you know five or ten thousand followers, but hundreds of comments because right. those people are all talking to that one person. That and that person was far more valuable for their business than the person who had a million followers that just gets you know ten thousand likes, but no comments. No one's asking questions. No one's engaging with that person. And so, to your point, Sal, you are far better off. And the kind of the original point I made about chasing after that those two people who are going to engage with that post that aligns with your business than gaining 10,000 people's attention by you know a, a booty pick or an ab pick or you know the trends right there's always these trendy videos that are going on TikTok or it hit the algorithm right yeah or the you know we we just came out of the uh you know the the dancing pointing to <laughs> things you know you always got you always got somebody who's trying to trend ride and and get attention and there's this like feedback loop, this positive feedback loop of oh it's working because i'm getting more views and i'm getting more likes and it's just like well yeah, but are these people really the type of people that are potentially going to buy from you? All you're really doing is driving your conversion rate down. You're getting a bunch more attention, but then the likelihood of that one of those people is going to convert is even lower because they're not coming in there and, for your information. And to go deeper with that, people are like, well, what's, who cares if your conversion rate goes down if you have more potential? It's harder to read your business that way. Yeah, of course. If you have a lot of people and your conversion rate goes down, like it's hard to read the signals in terms of what's working what's providing value. You want a high conversion rate because you could read the signals, pivot, and be very effective with your business. This is just a business fact. Um, so look, if you want followers, follow trends. If you want a business, you have to add value. It's a big difference between the two. I'll add one more yeah. thing to that too. You also, by by adding value, you're going in versus just trying to get followers, you also minimize the amount of negative attention that you tend yeah. to get. Mm. You know, when you're chasing just followers and you get lots of eyeballs, so do all the hate. And that's an that's an area that a lot of these influencers struggle with is, you know, it's it's hard enough to get attention. Then you finally get the attention and you get equally as bad attention yeah. as you get good attention. Mm -hmm. And then you have these influencers that go into depression. Because they're like, oh my God. Well, yeah, why are they turning on me? I mean, I remember even feeling that a little bit. I'm not somebody who even cares about shit like that. But man, you get you you get on your YouTube channel enough and you hear enough negative shit said about you and stuff like that, and you keep reading that every day. Boy, it's I don't care how confident you mm -hmm. are and secure you are with mm -hmm. yourself, boy, that that starts to affect you. So imagine if you're always doing these trendy things, using your body, you're attracting all these people, most of them aren't even close. So there's a there's a high percentage that a lot of those people are going to be the ones that are trolls that are going to be talking shit about you and that you, if you're constantly fighting those people boy that becomes really depressing to be managing a business like that so by adding value and going that direction and only trying to pick up three or five people through value versus getting thousands of people through attention you also minimize the amount of negative attention that you get awesome all right so this next one you know adam used to talk about this a lot um was just People jumping to any sponsor that offers them money because they get excited. Wow, this person's going to offer me, you know, a dollar per, you know, supplement or ten percent, you know, affiliate fee or whatever. And um, you know, you you always made a really really big deal about not doing this. So I'd love for you to go in this. Yeah, we were we were very slow to add sponsorship uh, to the podcast. We didn't we agreed early on that we didn't need it. When we do decide to do it, we're going to pick partners that we really love and we want to work with. And because of that, we had to turn down money for a long time because really quick the sharks come out. They see that you have you're a, a micro influencer. What we were back then. And they want to utilize you or use you to get your your following and sell the product. And it's tempting because you're trying to build a business and you're not making any money and you finally get a little bit of attention. You finally can now you have your first opportunity to make some money. But then what you do is you're it's a it's like a marriage. A, a partnership like us that we have is like a marriage. So is a an affiliate or a brand I decide to work with. So you're not gonna go around and just sleep with everybody or marry everybody. Like you should be very slow to that because it is now attached to your brand. I did a post the other day or I shared a post of uh, Jeremy Buendia, who's, you know, got, I don't know, I think he's up to 4 million followers. I've now seen this guy in, in like the last five, six years, he's on his fifth uh, protein shake, fifth company. I'm like, man, you have, you like it, these companies, they love to come and take advantage of someone like that and poach his audience because they're going to make a bunch of money and get attention because of his following. They, and all they care about is brand awareness. 
eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. four million people have seen their brand by whatever they're paying him to do that. And they, you know, eventually what'll probably happen after a six month or a one year contract, his revenue will start to decline. He won't be giving the ROI that they're paying him anymore. And then they mm -hmm. cut they're his out. ties yeah. and they already got what they wanted from him. Yeah. And then they then and then the next supplement comes along. And so and <clears throat> people are, are privy to this. They're not stupid. You're following that is paying attention to you and see that they see you just brand hopping. And then you then they start to question like does this guy really care about what he's providing us or is he just hopping from brand to brand, right. whoever's willing to pay him more? Where, and the reason why we convert so high for our, our brands is because we we talked about this on the show beforehand. We said, we're not going to take these partnerships. And when we do, you guys are going to know that these are brands that we love, we use, <coughs> that are aligned with our message. And so when you do it that way, then you get way more loyalty. You get a lot more people that are going to convert from it. And so this is a major mistake that you see a lot of influencers. One making. of the reasons why micro influencers companies are finding are great ways to advertise is because their followings trust what they have to say. Mm -hmm. You, There is no faster way to lose the trust of your audience than switching from company to company to company to company that provides the same product. This is the best protein powder that's on the market. <laughs> yeah. then, you know, a year later, no, this is the best protein Actually, powder. Actually, it's this one. And yeah. oh, this protein powder is breaking out. Know, after a while, your audience is like, yeah, dude, you're just <laughs> you're just making money and you're really not that trustworthy. Well, and what sucks is now you're the boy that cried wolf. Yeah. So then when you actually a real product that is maybe life changing for you comes along and you finally get to to partner up with them and then you talk about it, people are like, Oh okay, yeah, buddy, sure. Yeah. I, so that I, yeah. kills it kills your it kills your personal brand and your ability to actually truly influence and actually do well. And, and now on the flip side, a sponsor can actually hurt your business, which is what we're talking about. But a sponsor can also, if you do the right job or do a good job, help build your business. So I'll use an example of, of a company that we started working with that actually has now uh, helped our business. So we there's a long process of working with us. We don't work with just anybody. We're very picky. And as a result, our audience tends to trust us. We have the highest conversion rates almost of anybody in our space as a result. And, it's, and we take that very seriously. But I'll give you an example. We started working with a company called Viori a while ago before they were massive, before they were as big as they are now. We started working with them. We love the owner. We love the concept. The people are amazing. And Viori has since exploded. Now, uh, I'd like to think it's because of us, but I don't think so. I think they're just a, <laughs> an awesome company. But nonetheless, now we're affiliated with this company that's exploding. So now it brings us as much brand as awareness as, or almost as much as, as we bring them. It, we also look good because we've picked a great company to work with. You don't want to work with a company that then has a bad reputation. But it's also amazing to work with a company that grows and develops this incredible reputation because it's also a reflection on you. It's like, wow, look at that person working with that company and that company has really taken off and they've started working with them before they were that big and they continue to work with them. Like that looks pretty damn By good. By the way, to that point, Sal, and if you're listening and you are aspiring to be an influencer or already, or you already are, are one, you will come across a point where you, you have to make this decision where... I could partner with a brand that I love, that I think is going to be huge or great one day, but I might not make hardly any money or any money at first to build this relationship where I have this other competitor who's not like a no-name brand really, but, the, but they're willing to spend money on me right away yeah. and do that. And so a lot of times you will have to sacrifice potentially money to build that relationship first with the brand that you really like in order to show that you have value to add to their company to work on that partnership and relationship opposed to taking the quick money. And so there's going to be a point where that happens. And if you make the right decision, you you may not make it more money initially, but in the long run, you will we, to the points that you're making. We did that. I'm not yeah. going to say names because I don't want to call anybody out, but we were working with, I think, Organifi at the time. We've been with them for a long time. And then another supplement company, and I'm not going to say who they are, but let's just say they're one of the top, or they were at the time, one of the top bodybuilding brands that was out there. And just to get their attention was actually quite um, humbling. Like, wow, they want to work with us. But it's a no right out the gates because we don't like the products. We don't like their practices. They stand for a lot of things that we speak against. They, they would have offered us a lot more money than at the time Organifi did. But we said no because we looked down towards the future, not just right now. Um, which I think takes us to the next uh, point, which is being impatient. Um, this is a big mistake. I think part mm -hmm. of jumping with sponsors right away is being impatient, wanting to make money. But then the other part of being impatient is people tend to look at 
building a business through social media or becoming an influencer as if it's this business. It's, it's like it doesn't have, follow the same rules of business. Like I'm going to get into this and within a few months I should have this like flourishing business. In no other business space do people think this way. Nobody says, I'm going to open a brick and mortar anything in three months. I'm going to make something profitable. Yeah, Everybody right, expects right I'm going to lose money for the first year or yeah. two or five before I really start to make uh, a lot of money. For some reason, the influencer space, people have this weird perception that if it's not working after 90 days or six months or a year, well, then it's just not going to work. All business rules still apply. Mm -hmm. It still takes a long time, due diligence, and consistency to build a business. And the social media game is, is really no different. This is the advantage the four of us dorks had, I think, when we first got into this space, was that uh, we understood building a business really well before we got into the social media space, and we applied that same philosophy yeah. of what makes a business successful. And we knew, we embraced the failure, we embraced embraced the slow grind. We embraced not making money for a long time. You have to, I mean, that's just part of the process. If you think it's going to turn overnight, like you're, you're, you're in for a rude awakening because very few people get the overnight success. And I do think because there's these anomalies that are out there where somebody, it was mentioned on Joe Rogan. And so all of a sudden they get viral overnight or they go, come out with some product or they do some gimmicky thing that goes viral and they make a bunch of money off of that one viral post. I think because we have these anomalies, people think that that's a viable way to try and build that's your the business. Norm. Sure. But even then, like a lot of times they don't have the infrastructure in place. They don't have a lot of that added value already built into their business. So uh, once they get that virality, it's like they'll consume it all. And then, you know, they're left with nothing. And then, you know, that, that huge surge is just going to, go away what yeah. a great what a great point you make justin when we first started and we were starting to build some attraction and i would i would consider put us in the category of what you know micro influencer back then um people would always be like oh man if you guys got on joe rogan oh man if you guys and i used to say like i hope we don't get on joe rogan because at that point in the business we hadn't built the infrastructure and this is a year two years down right so we're a year two years in we're getting good traction business is doing all right we're not crushing we're it'd be making, like it'd be like having a shot glass and someone's like here let me give you this pool full of, wa full of water yes and just all the water's on the floor yes and you still like, got a shot glass yeah great i got a full glass of shot a shot <laughs> glass but then i missed all this other thing and like so there was a there was a part of me that like I didn't want that attention. I didn't want that traction yet. Like it takes time to build an infrastructure. It takes time to build a good back end and have all the systems in place mm -hmm. to support the traffic of thousands of people all of a sudden coming to your website. Like that would be the best and worst thing happening all at once because if a customer comes in and they have a bad experience the first time, the likelihood they're going to come back is extremely low. And then it's almost, in, it's definitely, they're not going to go tell anybody positive. There's a good likelihood they're going to say negative stuff, which yeah. could kill your business. I'd much rather go slow, very slow, slowly build it and be ready, learn from helping one or two people reiterate, help a couple more people reiterate, yeah. keep improving, keep, keep getting better. Keep, yeah, yeah, keep trying to get those two better. or three people to have such a good experience that they go and tell five other people. Then once you have proven that model really well, okay, now maybe we can handle this. But man, I don't think it was, it was, I, do you remember when I finally said, okay, I feel like. It was like four or five years later. Way was, later. Yeah. Way later. Way later. That I would say, I don't want Joe Rogan. That would be terrible if we got on there. We're not ready yet. We're not ready. Uh -huh. I barely feel like the business is ready to where it could support that kind of traffic. Yeah. I mean, just to give people an example, use ourselves as an example. Uh, we had normal jobs. We had families. And we would meet up every single week, multiple times, and record in the beginning three episodes and then five episodes a week for a full year before we made a dollar consistently every single week we'd show up with content record an episode we had no media experience so it was definitely took a lot longer than it does now edit the whole thing put it out there for 12 months without making a single dollar people have a tough time doing this for two months yeah. on Instagram where they could just type something out and post a picture so just to give you an example like we're definitely practicing what we preach like any business that's going to take time. That's just the bottom line. All right, all right, the next one, I think this one's really important because people don't realize that um, the if they pick the right medium for their strengths, it could have a profound impact on their business. Or if they pick the wrong medium for their strengths, um, then it could also have a profound impact on their business. So in the fitness space, 
or in any business space, I think what people tend to do is they tend to look at social media and they look at the platform <coughs> that tends to sell that space the best and they yeah. disregard their own strength. Yeah. So to give you an example, if I say fitness, most people look at Instagram because it's visual. Oh, fitness, Instagram, that's the place to go because of people posting pictures of their workouts and of their muscles and whatever. And that's where the biggest fitness influencer pages are. That's true. But if you suck at posting pictures, if you do a good job communicating through text or video, then it's a terrible medium for you. You're better off using another medium where you can really utilize your skills. I know people who built a tremendous fitness business through blogs because yeah. they were great at communicating in that style and Instagram just wasn't their strength at all. So there's a lot of different ways to build this business. Think of yourself, think of what you would do best uh, using, think of how you communicate that's where you should probably focus most of your time because that's where you're going to want to spend your time. And that's also where you're going to get the most impact. Yeah, I think if you're a if you're you're great at writing, um, I think things like Medium, I think blog Substack, posts, Substack, yeah. yeah, Substack, things like that to to great, uh, get attention. If you're really good at communicating uh, in long form, uh, I think things like podcast are really good. If you're uh, if you're really animated and comfortable speaking yeah. to the camera, I think charismatic things like, yeah, and YouTube, yeah, YouTube is really good for you. Um, if you are good with taking photos and you know visually can do things with like that, and you can write good captions, to obviously I think Instagram is good for you. If you're really good at doing very uh, controversial, short, witty type posts like Twitter, like so you have the ability to like say something that is like controversial and then be able to defend it within your within your uh, post. This is why I think Sal was always made. You like to argue, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I remember telling no, I Sal for the longest time, <laughs> yeah. like, you got to get on Twitter. I think it was made for you because Sal's great at this is saying something that I think gets a lot of attention from people. And then he can go back and forth and explain and articulate his point really well. So I think that type of medium does well. And the, and the idea is that and I remember hearing, I think it was Gary Vee talk about like viewing all of it at like as types of real estate. And at one point when you build a big enough business, it's smart to have, you know, a, acquired you know, property in all these categories and, and allow that to build equity in your business over time. So I do think it's smart to eventually, you know, dabble in all of these and have a presence in all of them. But initially, when you're trying to build and get traction, it makes the most sense to find the medium, not that's necessarily best for that that business you want to Sal's point, but that you speak the best yeah, to. It highlights your strengths. That you like, best. that you're most comfortable with, that you use well, lean into that get good at that, learn how to get traction there, and then you can start to to learn the other means versus trying to do all of it at once, which I see a lot when someone starts. Right out the gates. Yeah, out the gates. They've got a, a Twitter, they got an Instagram, they got Facebook because they, they're, they're told you need to have all these platforms. And it's like, yeah, eventually you can get there, but let's first prove that using the one you're best at and that you enjoy the most, that you can gain traction and attention there because if you can't even do it there for free, why would you waste your time and energy and equity everywhere else trying to build. Now, to that point, Adam, the next point is a mistake, which is always going in, uh, all in on one platform, right? You built your bit, you started your business, you found the platform that works with your strengths. Now it's growing, and then you just stay there. But that's the only place you're at, and you build everything there. Now, for me, the obvious mistake with that, and I'd, again, I'd love your uh, your input on this, Adam. Um, but the obvious mistake there is. You don't really own your business when you're on one of these platforms. Like if you're on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, they hold the keys. They really do. And they can take it away at any moment. And I've known a lot of people where they've lost their entire businesses because they were completely um, concentrated in one place. <coughs> so to me, that seems like the most obvious one. But So the, the way I, I help somebody with this that's, that's starting their business, the very first thing, I don't care which platform you've chose to go all in at is – to build an email list to complement it right away. So if you're becoming famous or, or building a lot of traction on say Instagram and you're not capturing those leads on an in, in getting them over to an email list simultaneously, you're you're in a huge risk category because if mm -hmm. something changes on Instagram, algorithm wise or like what happened to Sal completely kicked off imagine if our entire business revolved around your Instagram yeah, we would have been screwed when you went down for a, almost a year that would be crazy like that would have just totally destroyed our business now if you have an email list that you have and I know it's on Google's platform but they've email has been never touched it's been left the same yeah. for the longest it's probably one of the safest places 
as far as a platform that you can get people off because then you have this list that you own. And if for some reason, one of those platforms either shuts you down or changes its algorithm, you can reach your people and hopefully direct them to another potential mm -hmm. medium. So I think one of the best ways to hedge when you're building on a social media platform is to also complement that with an email list first. So that's like the easy, like, okay, I'm going to go, Step one. I'm going to go all in on the platform. I believe that I, I communicate the best on simultaneously. I'm going to build an email list that, and what does that look like? Okay. Offer something, either be a, a newsletter. Um, a, 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 and it doesn't, by the way, people, oh, there's a great book, um, Doug, it's slipping my mind right now that I cannot think of right now for um, that you and I both read. He's your one of your favorite marketing. Oh, guys. all of us read it. It's uh, it's you're one of your Russell favorite Brunson. marketing guys that we've Russell Brunson. There you go, Russell Brunson. Russell Brunson's uh, um, two books that I really like. That I, it's slipping the names for me right now. Yeah, that's uh, dot com secrets. Thank and you. Expert secrets. Thank you. Dot com secrets. Expert secrets. He goes into uh, how simple the the emailing can be. It doesn't need to be this like formal business email. It's just communicating with your people, adding value to them, whatever it is that you're doing. So run that simultaneously as you're also growing your whatever medium is. That is one of the ways to hedge. And then eventually when you get enough traction, enough of a business, you can start to acquire all the other platforms and build those out. But to protect yourself do not just go all in on one platform and not own your people or a list of your people because of the the fear of what could potentially happen. To yeah, I, it's a terrible fate. I've known a few people where they had great businesses and then got kicked off or lost. Like or overnight, hacked. yeah. Oh, or even just Crazy. got hacked and then they can't get it back for like a week and they lost tens of thousands of dollars in that entire week. Yep. Yep. Terrible, terrible uh, position to be in. Um, and it makes you very, very vulnerable. All right, lastly... This one's interesting because this has always been a challenge for people in the fitness space. I saw this before social media was yeah. even a thing in the gyms. And to me, this is a huge mistake because number one, it's wrong. And number two, not only is it wrong, it's the opposite of what's right. And that is the scarcity mindset. So here's what used to happen in gyms. When I would run gyms or own gyms and I'd have, let's say, trainers working for me, you have that trainer, they're trying to build their business. And they're afraid to refer potential clients to other trainers or other health practitioners mm -hmm. for fear of losing that person. So it's like, well, they're buying 10 sessions for me, but if I send them to that chiropractor that might help them with their low back or that nutrition person or that therapist or whatever, then their funds will get spread thin. They're not going to afford working with me anymore. And I'm going to lose that customer. Or right. if I refer to that trainer who's better at, let's say athletic performance than I am, mm -hmm. they're going to want to hire that trainer and not me. So I'm just going to not refer this person to anyone. I'm not even going to quote other fitness professionals for fear that this person is going to end up leaving me. This is not just the wrong way. It actually will kill and hurt your business. The most <coughs> successful trainers that I had in gyms. And one thing that I did that really built my business was I built a network of people that I refer to. Mm -hmm. And what it did is it made my value go through the roof as a trainer. It made my value go through the roof to where my clients, anytime they had an issue, they came to me and said, hey, Sal, do you have somebody that works with uh, you know, a naturopathic uh, medicine? Or do you know any, a good chiropractor? Or Sal, what do you think about acupuncture? I became the go-to person and uh, my value went through the roof. So this is not just the wrong way. Literally, it'll kill your business if you have this mentality. Yeah, I remember this um, mentality was something that I always had. Like just, you know, like if, if I'm not the best person for the job and I know somebody for that, like I'm gonna I'm gonna send them their way. And it's 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 a tough thing for a lot of people in the space to understand that um, you know what what's going to happen as a, result, as a result of that. I'm going to lose this client potentially. And, and uh, you know, when you're first starting off with your business, that's a really hard pill to swallow because, you know, you need every client you could potentially get. And this is all very like short-term thinking of, you know, I need this money. And so therefore I need to do this. And, you know, it, it was tempting a lot of times. Like I could take somebody through the process of like preparing them to get on stage and do a show, but I'm like, that, I'm not that guy. I'm not that trainer. This is not my strength. I know somebody that's amazing at this. I'm going to send them their way. And I just started doing that, especially when I was like an independent trainer on my own. And what did that do? That created an opportunity for that trainer to now look at what I do really well, start referring people to me. We start having this like just natural network that we create 
And it, it was a powerful thing that just started to funnel more clients my way. And then I had also like that kind of value established where I could send, you know, I, I, I would keep going out and find other people, like you said, like for chiropractors, for physical therapists and start thinking like even bigger than that of, you know, being able to support even a client that I have, I could send them, you know, to get even better service. Yeah. It's, it's all about building trust and add, adding value the, of all the points. This is the one I'm probably most passionate about because I was wildly successful as a trainer and have been my entire career. And I don't think I've ever been the smartest person in the room, uh, the most educated or the most experienced. Most handsome though. You would probably, <laughs> probably most I, I was, I was, okay. I was well liked. I was well liked by my clients, by my peers. And, and it was for these reasons. I was never afraid to say that I got this from somebody else. Oh man, I was, Sal told me this the other day and then, and then I, and then I, I have n I've never, cause the people that you're communicating this information to, they just want the right answers. They just want the best information. And they want to mm -hmm. trust you. They just want help. And, yeah. and so when you build that trust that you can be that maven who goes out and finds that information for them and provides them that great value, they don't give a shit that, yeah. it, that it didn't come from you first. They, they know that you're you're willing to do that. You're humble enough to go, hey, Sal told me this or Justin taught me this or Doug gave me this information and then, you, and then you're and then you now relaying it to them. But there's, there's this weird thing that trainers get and this happens in other businesses, but it's ex extremely high in, in the fitness space where they think like, oh my God, if I tell them that Justin told me, yeah. they're not gonna hire me anymore and they're gonna go <laughs> work with Justin and I'm no longer gonna have him as a client. It is, it is the scarcity mindset and it's, it's prevalent in gyms and it's even more so in the influencer and fitness space. I, it, it's why you, every once in a while, you'll hear me on this show where I throw these kind of subtle jabs at other fitness people. A lot of the times, the reason why I do shit like that is because I've already tried to reach out and help them out or do something for them or invite them on our show. And they, they freaking, have the scarcity mindset. And they, and they have the scarcity yeah. mindset that they don't want to come on our show or they don't want to communicate because they're afraid we're going to poach their business or maybe that they Conflict think that that's my desired outcome. By the way, that. that's our goal now when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if you ever, if you listen yeah, to this show consistently and you hear me sometimes do that and you just think maybe I'm a dick or whatever it is, it's like, nah, those are people, whenever I throw little jabs like yeah. that, these are people that I know have that scarcity mindset. And, and so I intentionally lesson. prod because it's such a terrible yeah. way to build a business and people will, will reward you for being that maven who shares yeah other people's advice. It's, it's okay to do that. They create a ceiling for themselves. They create a box for themselves. So you want to do all of it all the time, only, you, you know, your way, then you're going to be limited in your growth. And that's just the end of the story. Not to mention when you lead with this, um, you know, I just had a conversation with somebody. We will have her on the show in the future. She reached out to me and you know, she was like, she, we've known each other for a long time. She, we were on her podcast a long time ago and she wrote me this long old, you know, and she started it with, Hey, shooting my shot, you know, wants to come on the show. And I really like her content. I like her. So do you guys, we, we you guys know who mm -hmm. I'm talking about. She puts out really good at business information related to fitness, fitness yep. people and stuff. And you could tell she was like nervous to ask me to come on the show and that, you know, uh, you know, it's okay. You can say no, this and that, all these things that, you know, I know that you're affiliated with this other company. And it's like, I said, no, listen, um, I like the stuff you put out, come on the show and we'll do this. And I said, um, and I, the guys don't want anything in return. We're not, I don't, you don't need to give me something to get on there. Like, I think you put out good information. That's it. We're a friend. Therefore we would do that. And she was, you could tell she was just like blown away by that response. But it's like, when you do stuff like that, that's when, that's when those things end up coming back around. Now, maybe nine out of 10 don't, but that one person that you do solids or you help out with, without any sort of conditions or mm -hmm. transaction, I have to get something in return to help your business out or do mm -hmm. something for you. Boy, man, you, you keep, if you, if you lead a business life like that for a long enough period of time, those things really come back around and eventually, boy, does it really pay off. Yeah. Now that we've closed you on why scarcity mindset is terrible for your business, because we have to sell you on it. Here's the other part of it. That's actually quite true. If you, uh, avoid the scarcity mindset and you try to refer and, uh, you know, talk about other people that taught you in, uh, because you want that return, because you want people to give back to you, it's not going to work. 
It actually has to be done in a way to where it's actually selfless. Yeah. The person who does something with the intention of getting something back, it doesn't yeah. last very long. Very easy to tell. So big picture. Okay. So we, first we had to sell you on it, but now here's the big picture. If you're in the fitness space, cause you really want to help people, the best way you could help people is by collaborating with other experts and professionals because you don't know everything. So if you look at it from big picture, which we've done many times, we have trainers. We just had Braden come on the show. There's zero in it for us, all for him. Actually, for us, it's just for our audience. The guy's got great information. He's another person you can follow in the fitness space that's got good information. We did this with Jordan Shallow before he became massive. We loved his information. He, prov he provided value that we weren't necessarily providing in a way that we didn't provide. We put him on our show. We had zero potential growth from that. It was like- Dr. Was all, Brink, Danny Dr. Mantrega. Right. So, uh, so uh, name it. big picture, it's like, okay, I'm here to help people. This is the best way to help people. And then, of course, we already sold you on why it's going to help you build your business. And again, if you go into it thinking, I'm going to get something in return, it's not going to work. It has to be because you see this as being the best way to bring value uh, to your It has audience. to be unconditional love. That's it, 100%. Mm -hmm. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out some of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. I'm on Instagram at Mind Pump DeStefano, and Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 